Well, we're going to uh, undertake a study um, in, in our usual style. Uh, we're going to undertake first and second. Um, Corinthians is the way you know it. And uh, so we are uh, in the first session of what will be probably, uh, could be more than a dozen. And uh, we are in an introduction in chapter one. And uh, the other label I like to use for this study is First Californians, okay? And I, I, I have my tongue in my cheek, of course. On the other hand, it's really not a far-fetched analogy. Uh, we're going to take a look. So we're looking at session one and chapter one of what I'm, with my tongue in my cheek, I'm going to call uh, First Californians. And so why do I say that? You see, the city of Corinth, we need to understand what the city of Corinth was really, was really all about in those days. It was a major influence in that entire part of that world. And in every respect, including the very word Corinth became a synonym for fornication, uh, which of course became idiomatic for the whole Gentile culture, let alone Corinth. But it became, to Corinthianize was the same thing as uh, uh, being, being uh, given to uh, uh, sexual abuse, sexual uh, conduct. So when I teach this book, especially in America, I can't resist for calling this study First Californians, okay? And uh, that is not a, a um, favorable epithet. That is intended to be derogatory, in a sense. And it's unfortunate that that epithet is really justified. In other words, California has become very much in our culture what Corinth was in their culture. So that parallel, I'm just not being cute, it's a, I'm trying to draw your understanding of what they were up against there. So our agenda in the study especially will be to give you a little bit of geopolitical background on the city of Corinth, why it, it was the way it was. We'll talk about the occasion of Paul writing this particular letter. It's a very important letter. When you get to the New Testament, of course, you have the four Gospels and then the book of Acts, which we tend to treat almost like a fifth Gospel. Then the first epistle we encounter is probably the most intellectual, intellectually challenging document ever penned on the planet Earth, the book of Romans. But what follows right behind that now is, are the letters to the Corinthians. And uh, we're going we're gonna to realize that those letters are going to hit us right between the eyes in a number of areas. Then we, once we give you a little background, then we'll jump into a verse by verse dealing with the book as is our style. But we're also going to encounter some other topics as we go. One of the topics we're going to encounter is a concept that I like to call spiritual entrepreneurship. Most people haven't, you don't find that in the literature, but I'll show you why I think it's very fundamental and very important. Paul is also going to hit us head on right up front with the, the disparity between our position in Christ and our actual walk. And uh, how, how do they differ? We need to understand that. And then I'm going to also conclude this study today by exploring what I like to call the ultimate oxymoron. An oxymoron is a term we use for a self-contradictory phrase. I, we're gonna, I'm going to show you what I believe is the ultimate oxymoron before we're through. Well, let's first of all talk about the peculiar geopolitical advantage of the city of Corinth. It enjoyed a very strategic geographic position, and that guaranteed its commercial prosperity. It was a very, very prosperous place. It couldn't help but be because of its unique position. They say a sailor never takes around Malaya until he first writes his will. What do they mean by that? You need to understand the map of Greece. And if you look at the southern part of the place of Greece, you see the, uh, there's a peninsula down here. And it's, it's advantageous to go up through that channel and, you, and cross that isthmus rather than go around through all those storms. And so Corinth is located right on that isthmus. So it's a huge commercial advantage to someone doing shipping is to ship up to Corinth, offload a ship, carry it across the isthmus, and reload it, and you avoid this very treacherous, dangerous um, uh, 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 travel, if you will. 
And so it was situated on this very narrow esmus, a very narrow uh, uh, part of land there. And uh, so it, uh, this, this long and risky voyage is very worth avoiding, obviously. Now, small vessels used a ship tramway with wooden rails to get across the peninsula. The isthmus was called Dalakis, which is a place of dragging across. And larger vessels, of course, required reloading. Nero, Emperor Nero, tried to cut a, a, a canal across it, but they were not successful at pulling it off. There's a modern canal built by the French back at the end of the 19th century that follows the route, route that Nero was hoping to do. And all north-south trade routes intersect east and west right there at Corinth. So Car Corinth is right at the center of the commercial world. Okay, So a it was a very ancient city. It appears in Homer's Iliad. That would be 9th century BC, for example. So this, the, the, this has a very ancient history. And uh, the Greek historian records it that it was here that the first battleships, the triremes, were first built. And uh, it's also the setting for the legendary Argus, where Jason sailed the seas searching for the Golden Fleece. These all center on Corinth, if you will. Okay. Now the new city of Corinth was primarily a Roman colony. And you'll notice if you, in your Bible that there are Latin names all through associated with this, both in the Book of Romans and in Acts and, of course, 1 Corinthians 16. Corinth was highly cosmopolitan, though. Greeks, Latins, Syrians, Asiatics, Egyptians, Jews, it was uh, uh, all that rolled up in one. There were over a thousand prostitutes that were connected with the Temple of Aphrodite in the Ark of Corinth, which is a, an Acropolis on a 2,000 foot high granite hill overlooking Old Corinth. And so, and we could go through all of this. They celebrate the Aphrodite of the beautiful buttocks in, in, in some of these, and I won't go into all of that here. But there were uh, all the ones you can imagine. Um, Aesculapius, Apollo, Poseidon, Athena, Hera, Hermes, and the Egyptian gods, were, uh, Isis and Serapis, were all worshipped in Corinth. So it was the center of paganism in every sense of that term. Even in the pagan world, the city was known for its moral corruption. The term Corinth was a derogatory term. And Paul lists some of these things that it's known for. Fornica uh, uh, fornication, pornea, thus pornography, idolatry, adultery, effeminacy, homosexuality, stealing, covetousness, drunkenness, and swindling and all the rest of it. And he'll do that. We'll get into that in chapter 6. So Corinth came to imply licentiousness, to Corinthianize was to live in debauchery, to go to the devil, so to speak. Those terms were very, very strong negative ones. So the way we can look at it, the city of Corinth was like Hollywood, Las Vegas, and New York all rolled into one. If you, can, if you get the feeling for that, you get a, a flavor of what we're, what we're dealing with with uh, Corinth. It was the capital of the Roman uh, province of Achaia, and uh, it was the most populous and wealthy uh, t uh, t uh, place in all of Greece. The finest athletes were attracted to the Isthmian Games. They were so dominant that they were celebrated even after the city was destroyed. Those games became a big deal, obviously. Now, Corinth also enjoyed a very fertile soil. Grapes and other crops flourished there. The word current comes from Corinth, interestingly enough. Now, men of pleasure, surrendering to every lust, men recognized no superior and no law, but their own desires. That was, does that sound like today's world? More and more, doesn't it? And uh, Horace said, it's not every man's lot to get to Corinth. <laughs> that was his thing. And he was referring, of course, to the great expense of the self-indulgent life at Corinth. And the, the, the California is running at a close second. California is a very expensive place to run a business. That's why many businesses are leaving. But also with the entertainment industry and a lot of other reasons, it is very much a, a self-indulgent uh, uh, culture there. Well, let's talk about Paul at Corinth. Remember, Paul went to Philippi. He met opposition by fanatical Jews. And then he went to Thessalonica and then from there to Berea and then on to Athens, but with very little success. We always talk about his visit to Athens, but it was not that successful. And uh, his 18 months there were compressed into 17 verses in Acts 18. And uh, 
So then he went to Corinth with much trembling, we, we find in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And he went alone because Silas and Timothy were occupied in Macedonia. So he went there on his own. Now interestingly enough, he lodged with Aquila and Priscilla. Now these, both these Jews were expelled from Rome by decree of Emperor Claudius back in AD 49 approximately. So they were there and they roomed together with Paul. Why? Because they all had the same vocational skills. Aquila and Priscilla and Paul had skills and they were known as tent makers. Now you hear a lot of speculation about tent making. No, it's very clear. We know very, a great deal what they did. It's, they were leather workers by trade. And what was that all about? Tent making, Paul's native province of Cilicia, where he came from, was noted for its good grade of goat's hair cloth, a very lightweight kind of leather. And it was used largely for tents, and that it was exported by the designation Cilian cloth. And uh, that's what, uh, uh, so Paul's skill in this craft probably consisted of sewing together the proper lengths of cloth and the attaching of ropes and loops. When people traveled in those days, many of them traveled with, on their back, with tents on their back. And it was a skill, it was a, something that, that involved some special skills. Now something else you should understand, in the Jewish culture, Jewish parents always taught their children a trade. Um, they, the rabbis would say, he that doesn't teach a trade raises a thief. No matter how bright they were, whatever education they had, on, separate from that, they had to learn a trade. And, uh, so that, uh, the, and it was usually a vocation that would be pursued in successive generations in a family. So they became good at that, whether it was in diamonds or leather working or whatever it was, they would learn a trade. And they felt that was just part of growing up, part of, of their skill set to face life with. And so that tells us something about Paul that most people don't realize, and we're going to be dealing with this topic in more detail later in the study of 1 Corinthians. But it's a concept that I call spiritual entrepreneurship. And uh, the, uh, Paul is, turns out to be the best example of what we mean here. He never took donations for himself from those he was ministering to. Many people don't realize that. He would take donations for others. He bragged many times when he was dealing with a group, he could say that he, it never, he never charged them anything. He provided his own substance. How did he do that? From his own vocations. He never took, he, he did solicit donations, but for the, city, for the church in Jerusalem or whatever. And so uh, he only took donations for others. He supported himself by his vocational skills. And as you read Paul's epistles, you don't pick up on that unless you're watching closely. But he makes a point of that, that he managed himself, he, that he was not a burden to those that he was ministering to. And uh, I think that's, that, that leads to, a, he maintained his personal independence as much as possible. And we're going to be talking more about that as a way of life uh, as we develop uh, more in the epistle. So, now Paul ultimately was to leave the synagogue. He was cast out by organized religion. That should not surprise us. There's a book by E.H. Broadbent called The Pilgrim Church. And I think it's a must read for every Christian to realize that from Acts chapter 2 through our current era, there's always been small groups of believers that clung to the Bible as their source. But all through history, they are stamped out by the local church. It's interesting to realize that organized religion in whatever form. I'm not just talking about the Protestant, the Catholics. No, no. In those places where Protestant uh, governance was established, there was abuses of those that tried to be independently clinging to the scriptures alone. And we need to understand that. And it's interesting that Paul himself was cast out by his organized religion. He set up shop right, up neighbor, right next door with justice, it turns out, we'll see. And uh, so it's interesting. Remember the blind man who was cast out of the synagogue? Then Jesus found him and he was rejected by men and the Lord gave him special power. It's interesting how the one that the Lord blesses is often rejected by the group. To be rejected by men is often a sign of acceptance with the Lord. 
And the Lord himself encourages Paul in Acts 18 and so forth. So we'll be seeing some of that unfold here. Now there are only three Jews mentioned in the epistle. Most of the converts we're going to encounter were Gentiles. Crispus was a ruler of the synagogue. He became a believer in Acts 18. Sothenes may be the synagogue ruler, but he also became a believer. And Gaius gave hospitality to Paul and the whole church in Romans 16, that, which was written from Corinth, by the way. The, 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 uh, the, the, the epistle of the Romans was written from Corinth. Let's not overlook that. And so, Erastus was the city's director of public works. And there's an inscription in Corinth that speaks of an Erastus who laid down a pavement at his own expense. So we have some archaeological support there. And Gallio, a proconsul, refuses to hear a purely religious matter in Acts 18. So those were the Gentiles. But anyway, sometime after Paul left Corinth, Apollos, a learned man from Alexandria, arrived. He had been in Ephesus teaching Christianity, but he knew only John's baptism. And Aquila and Priscilla explained the way of, uh, of God more accurately. And that's all part of Acts 18 in your background here. Apollo then went to Acacia, of which Corinth was the capital. Okay. And sometime later, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church. Now, the letter that he wrote apparently perished. It's made reference to. Okay. And this was, this was an initiating letter. Some scholars believe it may be preserved in concept in 2 Corinthians 6, and we'll deal with that later when we get there. But this letter apparently had been misunderstood. And Paul mentions it to clear up a misconception. Now remember the chapters were not divided up until the 13th century, the verses not till the 16th. So the way our Bible is partitioned came much later, if you understand. Okay. Now the occasion of what we call 1 Corinthians, not the first letter, the first letter's been lost. Well, the, the, what we call 1 Corinthians, the household of Chloe brought Paul news of cliques in the church. And the church wrote him a letter, and presumably brought by, uh, to Ephesus by Stephanus, Fortunus, and Achaeus, and who probably added their own comments. So they, they bring that news to Paul, and uh, uh, when he's in Ephesus, that there's problems here. And the situation is very serious. So in response to their report, Paul responds by writing the letter we are studying called 1 Corinthians. But it's really a, a, a letter in response to apparently confusion of a, from a previous letter. Okay. That leads to what we're going to call the painful visit. Because the situation gets worse, even after Paul sends 1 Corinthians. Paul felt it necessary to leave his work in Ephesus and pay a hurried visit in an attempt to set things right in Corinth. Th this visit is implied in passages in 2 Corinthians which speak of Paul as being ready to pay a third visit to Corinth. His second visit had, was already passed. So this is what we call the painful visit. His references to coming again in sorrow indicate that this visit had been an unpleasant one. It failed to clear up the situation, and Paul went away profoundly upset by all this. So that leads to what's called the severe letter. Paul determined to write another letter, obviously very severe in tone, and it cost him much to write that. Had it not been successful, it might have conceivably have meant a final rupture between Paul and this church that he had founded. Very critical issue here. The letter seems to have been lost, the so-called severe letter. Many scholars believe part of this letter is preserved in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Now, this letter, the so-called severe letter, was apparently taken by Titus, who was to return to Macedonia and Troas. Paul was impatient to know how it had been received. He wrote the severe letter, very nervous about how it was received. When he eventually catches up to Titus, he is relieved to discover that all is well. It didn't go badly, it went well. It was a severe letter, but it was received, if you will. So, and out of this great relief and joy, Paul wrote then the letter we call 2 Corinthians. Almost certainly he visited the church soon afterwards. So I want to lay this out in front of you so you have a perspective as we get into 1 Corinthians. Because you're going to see allusions to three visits and four letters. 
the three visits. There were three visits. The first one when the church was first founded, the so-called painful visit, and the visit after 2 Corinthians had been sent. But there are four letters. The first letter was the, is referred to as the previous letter. The second letter is the one that we call 1 Corinthians. Then there was the severe letter that was very critical but has been lost. And the fourth letter called 2 Corinthians. That went, it fortunately went very well. So I mention that because it's easily, easy to get confused. Because we'll deal with this as we go too. But that give you the background. Now there's really no question about the authorship. There's no doubt that Paul was the author. He cited as the author by 1st Clement in 47 and uh, first century letter. He's freely quoted by Ignatius and Polycarp and uh, uh, frequent other references. So there's, there's really no significant scholastic doubt about authorship. But the church in Corinth is known as the carnal church. Spiritual babes, immature, undeveloped spiritually. That's what we're dealing with here. Unseparated from the world. They have only a minimum of doctrine. What they do have is mostly practical conduct related. And we're going to be getting right into all of that as we get into this. Now, talk about key topics that we're going to encounter here. Paul's going to talk about discipline in chapter 5. He's going to talk about going to the law. Christians shouldn't be going to the law, according to Paul, in chapter 6. He talks a lot about marriage and divorce in chapter 7. Christian liberty in chapters 8, 9, and 10. The Lord's table will be dealt with in chapter 11. The gift of tongues will be talked about in chapters 12 and 14. Most of what we know about the charisma, of the, 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 the uh, gift of tongues, is in, from two chapters, chapters 12 and 14. And what's provocative is that right in the middle of those, Paul says, I show you a better way. And we have the incredible chapter 13, the love chapter. And then, of course, one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible we'll encounter in the resurrection chapter in chapter 15. So that's the menu for 1 Corinthians as we get into it. So let's just jump in verse by verse. That's, that's the way, that's enough palaver to get as background. So let's jump in. First Californians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sophonies, our brother. Now, called, Paul called. That's a crucial issue. He's highlighting the divine origin of his uh, apostolate uh, authority. He's, he's distinctive here. And Sophonies, our brother, it may be the Jewish synagogue ruler, a believer, that we encounter in Acts 18. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, we're from verse 2 through, t through 9, we're going to be encountering a, 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 uh, something we need to distinguish between one's position and one's practice. And uh, if, you, uh, if you don't understand that, you won't understand any other part of the whole New Testament. We need to understand the difference our, between our position and our actual practice or our walk. So we'll deal with that. Unto the church of God, of course, and uh, so the word there is ecclesia assembly. And uh, in the Septuagint, the Greek of the Old Testament, that same word is used of the people of Israel. Same terms used. Church of God, sanctified saints. Remember that this is Corinth. They are sanctified. And yet they're the most carnal, worldly, sectarian church. And yet they are saved. That's going to give us some real trouble as we begin to embrace that, to realize that they're bad news. They are carnal. And yet, they're saved. <coughs> that should be disturbing. We need to, under, we need to get that uh, understood here. The next nine verses announces who they, that's ourselves also, are before he addresses their problems. Let's take a look at verse 2. Under the church of God, which is Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And uh, all that in every place. And uh, this letter is addressed to all of us. 
Let's understand that. It isn't just to those bad guys back there in Corinth. No, to all of us who seek to own the Lordship of Christ. We're the focused. And this parallels the Old Testament where they use the name of Yorivave as the highest possible place. And that's the, 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 they're doing that here with the Messiah, of course. Now, Paul does not threaten them with the loss of their salvation. I want you to understand that. As, as he deals with their problems, he doesn't challenge the security of their salvation. Why? Because it's God's faithfulness, not theirs, that's at issue. God's faithfulness is what locks us in, not our conduct. Okay? Remember the prodigal son. We all know the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son blew his inheritance, but he never lost his sonship. That's the real point of that story. It's often missed unless it's taught well in Luke 15. Well, Paul continues, Now grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He never calls him Jesus. It's always the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is not his last name. It's his title. Messiah. Mashiach. In Hebrew. Grace. Charis. That's the typical Greek uh, greeting. And the Hebrew is Shalom. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, no one in the scriptures ever addresses our blessed Savior merely as Jesus, by the way. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but you might be alert to that. It's always the Lord Jesus. And uh, this epistle will emphasize his lordship. If he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. So he wants to be number one on a list of one, is the way I like to summarize that. Paul continues, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So you notice he, in these first nine verses he's going to announce who they, we, are before he addresses their problems. He lets us understand our standing before he gets at the problems that need to be solved. See, I thank my God always on your behalf. He's talking to the Corinthians. He's talking to us as the Californians, in quotes, okay. Um, For the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him. Really? In all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testament of Christ was confirmed in you. So that's the positive. So he starts right there with, with it, uh, given, given you by Jesus Christ. And... Uh, God's grace is given. You don't earn it. It's given. And it's not for their achievements. It's not earned. It's given. We need to understand that. So, even as testament of Christ was confirmed, okay, the verb, this is verb used in papyri in the legal sense of guaranteeing. Confirmed in the sense of being guaranteed. And of course, in Philippians, Paul reminds us, he that began a good work will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And what he starts, he finishes. And he started a good work in you. And what he starts, he'll finish. It will never be said of God that he saved a man and then couldn't keep him. The shepherd keeps the sheep, not the sheep. So we see what Paul is really setting us up here for. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, now the word gift is charisma. It's used in the following ways. It can be used in salvation in Romans 5. It's used of God's good gifts in general in Romans 11. It's special endowments of the spirits in Romans 12. It's all of God. It's all of grace in any case. Okay. And no church was more richly endowed and yet no church was more carnal. Let that sink in for a minute. There's no church that had more spiritual gifts. And yet, they became more occupied with the gift rather than the giver. And that, every one of us can fall into that same trap as we go forward here. There's some lexicographical subtleties I'll mention too because you'll read people that make a big thing of some of these words. Perusia means personal presence. And that is used by Paul on the coming of Stephanus in 1 Corinthians 16, of Titus. 
In other words, the personal presence, it can be uh, of Paul to Philip, of Paul himself. And of course, it's usually the blessed return of the Lord. But when that word occurs, it's not necessarily that. That's the point, okay? Some people make a big thing of Perugia's some kind of, no, no, it's just personal presence. And it's because it's even men mentioned of the destruction of the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. Another word is apocalypsis, which really means unveiling or revelation. And what that implies is perceptibility. And uh, it's used of the Lord all through the scriptures, and of the sons of God at his return in Romans 8, and of the man of sin even of 2 Thessalonians 2. And the other word that you'll run into is pephaneia, which is brightness or manifestation. And uh, it's used of the first advent in 2 Timothy 1, but it's used of the second advent in 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, and Titus, and elsewhere. My point, really, the I bring this up is you'll find people that will take these three words out of context and try to mystify them somehow. They're, they're used in a variety of ways. The use of the word in and of itself um, uh, uh, really just emphasizes the visibility of, the, of a return. It's not necessarily something beyond that. But anyway, let's move on here. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, by the way, there is a distinction when you speak of the day of Christ, because it's always a day of blessing, as a day of the Lord is connected with judgment. The reason it's hard to sell is because some places the King James makes it wrong, does it the wrong way. If it did it correct, those things would be used. The day of Christ is always a positive thing. Day of Lord is a judgment thing. But unfortunately, it's, the translators in the King James didn't stay. So I wouldn't make too much of that as we go forward here. Uh, called into the fellowship of his son. And the word fellowship there is a word I'm sure you're familiar with by now. Koinonia which means fellowship or communion or communication. It is also the Greek word for fiduciary, if you understand what that word means. A very precious word to all of us, I think, and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the Lord Jesus Christ his, is the name of our Savior. It's mentioned 10 times in 10 verses. That's it's the, it, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is the way you want to deal with that. And so, now verses two, 2 through 9, illustrate a distinction that's constantly made in all the epistles between the believers standing in Christ and, 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 and standing in Christ Jesus, being in the family of God, and the contrast between that and our walk, which is our actual state. And uh, so, so standing in grace is the result of the work of Christ, and it is fully entered into the moment that Christ is received by faith. You're standing in grace. Now, I won't go through all these because they're in your notes, but I strongly urge you to track down each of these to really understand your standing in grace, which is 100% accomplished by God, not by you. It was a gift as far as you're concerned. Understand that, because that's going to be in contrast to what's coming, okay? The walk is that all the work of God on his behalf, there are five things that God is going to be doing with you that have as their object to make the believer's character conformed to his exalted standing in Christ, okay? The application of the word to walk in conscience is mentioned in John 17 and Ephesians 5. Divine chastenings are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11, Hebrews 12. We'll be dealing with all of these. The ministry of the Spirit in Ephesians 4. And, of course, the difficulties and trials of daily life, 1 Peter 4. And uh, so, and then the final transformation and appearance of Christ, 1 John 3, 2. These five things are God's work to bring your character to, into conformance with your standing in Christ. You have position already, but your walk will be a work in progress. Uh, the way I like to also put it, the position is past tense. Your position is done. It was done on a cross, you know, 2,000 years ago. Your walk, you're a work in progress. God is not finished with any of us in this room. We're all works in progress. We're all undergoing these five things to bring us into conformity to that position. 
Well, that leads us now into divisions that is part of the problem. The quibbling, following personalities, wrangling over non-essentials is one of the concerns Paul has here. And I want to remind you of what I call Augustine's admonition. This hangs in my wife's ministry lobby, and I love it there. And it's, uh, uh, I, I think it's, uh, he's, he says, in essentials, we seek unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, agape. And that's, that's, that really says it all. In the essentials, we want unity. Are there some things that we may have difference of view on? If they're not essentials, fine. We enjoy liberty. And we're going to talk a lot about liberty in Christ later on in this epistle. But in all these things, agape should be the, the archstick. Okay, so let's go on here. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And uh, so, no divisions. And he's not talking about denominations here. He's talking about individual, personal viewpoints, if you will. And uh, the brethren is used 39 times in this letter. And uh, in Romans and Thessalonians, 19 times each. Brethren, we are brothers in Christ. This, with all the problems in Corinth, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that they were brothers. In the Institute, we try to admonish that we never make comments on other ministries. We may compare what's been published with what the Bible says, different thing, issue. But we do not comment on other ministries. The out is it tears, rips up. This produces dissensions and cl uh, cliques. We're not talking about denominations here. We're talking about internal, not external divisions here. Now the question you have to ask you is, does Christ love his church? Of course he does. Then don't we grieve him when we attack a member of it? It astonishes me, especially on the internet, to see people who call themselves Christian that spend all their energies attacking other Christians. That is such a, uh, it's insanity. The good news, it's so conspicuous, it has little impact, I think. Most people realize that, that's just self-contradictory stuff. But it's astonishing to me that people that, I, uh, that, that claim, I'm not saying they are Christians, they, they masquerade as Christians, but they spend all their energies tearing other Christians down. There's something wrong with that. I know where that comes from. I know where that comes from. For it hath been declared unto me of you, by my, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, we don't know anything about Chloe, by the way. She's not otherwise known. I haven't been able to track anything out about her. But anyway, that's where we're getting the information here. Now, this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? He's obviously challenging them, and, and he may be using these as, as, as metaphors, not literal, but in, nevertheless, they may not be actual names. They may be simply using them figuratively. He doesn't put any one person on the spot. Corinth loved philosophers, and so they followed the teaching of special teachers. We all do that. We tend to follow teachers that we enjoy particularly. But that's not the same thing of, of d dividing Christ. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. But a couple of exceptions here, but Christ Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. In other words, what he's trying to say is, I baptized a few as an exceptions. He's glad he didn't do more of it because he, he would feel that he's maybe leading that. So, it's appropriate for a new believer to be baptized. But don't look to the peop person who baptizes you. Look to the Lord. That's what it's all about. That's what he's, in effect, saying here. Now, uh, so about Christ delega delegated this to his followers. Paul did baptize, but his exceptions. But now this leads to a little topic that I really enjoy. The foolishness of God. Now that phrase has got to be impossible. That is a strange, what, do we, you know, what is an oxymoron? That's a self-contradictory phrase, a jumbo shrimp. Military intelligence. Mm -hmm. Engineering commitment. <laughs> and you can go on and on like this. Okay. Well, what's the ultimate oxymoron? Let's see what Paul develops here from verse 17 and following. 
Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So he's denying the wisdom of words here. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Verse 18 of chapter 1 is one of those verses that is more poignant uh, that you, than you realize until you, when you first read it. The preaching of the cross, it divides the entire world into two mutually exclusive categories. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You are in one of those two groups, whether you like it or not. The two mutually exclusive groups. And uh, the word foolishness is amoria, which is moronic. And uh, everyone in the world is presently in one of these two classes, saved or lost. And how do you know whether you're saved or not? Is the message of Christ foolishness, bizarre, or weird? The cross is at the same time both the declaration of man's utter depravity and the manifestation of God's infinite love. Both in one powerful um, declaration. Perish means lost, of course. So Paul continues, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? That's his challenge. That's his challenge. Now, Paul quotes here from Isaiah and Psalms and so forth. See, the Christian has no need for philosophy. Where it agrees with Scripture, it's unnecessary. Where it disagrees, it is wrong and misleading. And it has nothing to reliable offer. Colossians 2.8 is your ultimate authority on that particular topic. And uh, by the way, one third of Paul's quotes came from Isaiah, interestingly enough. And uh, Eon is this age, and cosmos is a ter it refers to this ordered universe. The word cosmos is actually to bring order out of chaos, is what it means. So that's where the word cosmetic comes from, to bring order out of chaos. I just thought I'd share that with you girls so you'd enjoy that a little bit. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. In Corinth, there were 50 different philosophical movements, each with their favorite philosopher. Corinth was full of that. But Paul continues, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks after wisdom. And see, the Jews require a sign. They demanded a sign all through the Gospels, you may recall that. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Boy, we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block. It's interesting to discover Orthodox Jews who will admit that there are certain passages they're not allowed to read in their Bible because they didn't make sense. And uh, Ron usually will point out to them that that's because they're looking at it through Talmudic glasses. Take a look at those same passages from the, through the New Testament and you discover their portrayals of the Messiah. The Akedah is not about child sacrifice. It's about a father offering his son. And, and once you realize that, it's, and it's interesting how the occasions do occur where an Orthodox, some of the Orthodox background, gets shattered into tears in moments as he realizes from the very passages that he wasn't allowed to read in his yeshiva. It portrays the reality that Christ is their Messiah. And it's fascinating to see how frequently we, we have that recognition acknowledged. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And uh, see the problem with the Orthodox Jews is they don't know their own scriptures. And that's what's so exciting. If you show them in their own scriptures, uh, you'll disco they discover their Messiah. In Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9, powerful, powerful uh, things there. 
if 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 the uh, uh, if this ca if the power of God came through wisdom, that would open the way of salvation only to the intellectually gifted. You see, that would be that that, that wouldn't be God's desire because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. There's that phrase. I just can't get used to that phrase. The foolishness of God. How can? Uh, that's what a strange collection of words that is. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God. I, uh, how can you even use that phrase? See, it has to. I regard that as the ultimate oxymoron. The, uh, the self, foolishness of God. Have you ever noticed how God goes out of His way to go weird? He decides to wipe out the entire planet Earth and save eight people. So he has them build a barge. I mean, that whole story and from, from Genesis 6 on, you keep, I'm sorry, it's weird. It, it doesn't stop there. Samson wipes out a bunch of things with the jawbone of an ass. Okay? And uh, you go through Elisha and Naaman the leper. Naaman the leper has got leprosy. He's the head of the Syrian army. And go bathe in the in in the uh, uh, Jordan seven times. You've got to be kidding! It muddy all the end. Do it, and when he finally does, he gets healed. I mean, God goes out of his way to do things in a weird way. The one of my favorites is the brazen serpent. Moses confronted with all these snakes killing people, and he goes to the Lord. The Lord says, "Put a brass serpent up on a pole on the on the hill. Everyone that looks at it will be saved." And and he does, and they do. The interesting thing about Moses and the brazen serpent, you can search every verse of the entire Old Testament and not have that explained. That's a weird thing. A brass serpent on a pole, what's that got to do with anything? I thought the serpent was sin. Brass serpent. In fact, that serpent is still around a thousand years later and Hezekiah has to destroy it. Now, who's the thing of brass? Because they're worshiping the darn thing. It isn't until you get to John chapter 3 where Nicodemus at night has the Messiah explain to him what this, as Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be raised up. And in that one little verse, verse 14 of John 3, it explains, you suddenly realize the whole episode in Numbers 21 was a foreshadowing of the Messiah designed from the beginning. In fact, that very episode gives, gives rise to the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16, as he explains to Nicodemus what Moses and the brass and serpent was really all about. Jonah and the big fish, that's another one. God calls Jonah to go give a message to the Nineveh, and he, want, he goes, takes a, the, 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 goes far, as fast as he can the other way. So God raises a fish to swallow him, and that, that whole episode is, you've got to admit, is weird. God seems to go out of his way to do these things. And what's the ultimate foolishness? What is the ultimate foolishness? What action of God would seem to be the strangest of all of these things? That a wooden cross in Judea would become the central fulcrum of the entire history of the entire universe. And if you really want to get it, we did a, we did a special study on that, uh, of Isaiah 53, but it's, it has a lot more to do than just you and I. There's much more at stake there. I encourage you to take a look at that. Paul continues, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And by the way, I understand Lady Huntington, which was a friend of Whitfield's and the Wesleys, she claimed she was saved by an M. Because it says not many noble. It doesn't say not any noble. <laughs> she felt that M allowed her to be <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Not many okay. Now, are called. Were you called? Amen. And what is your calling? That's my wonderful, that's what uh, the Institute's all about. Is you say you're saved, if I say, how many of you are saved, all your hands will go up, great. How many of you know what your calling is? Have you discovered it yet? The most exciting thing in life is to find out what you are called to.
There was a reason he had you saved. And when you discover what that is, it eclipses everything else. Okay. Points to the divine initiative that's involved here. And uh, God chose. And if he chose, that means he's got purposes. You see, our intrinsic materialism, that's for all of us, our carnality should be eclipsed by the revel realization that we are subject to the divine calling by God himself. Whatever leanings we have to materialism sh should be eclipsed by the realization that God has called us to something other than that. God hath chosen the foolish thing. He chooses. He's got reasons for that. There were 11 disciples that were lowly Galileans. They were fishermen, tax collectors, pe and peasants. Only one was a gentleman, a Judean. His name was Judas. Saul of Tarsus was a contrast. He was educated in two cultures, was a leader powerfully placed. He counted it all for naught. He had to give up his religion in order to get to heaven. Think about that. Well, Paul continues, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Praise God. Hath God chosen. God chooses these things. He chooses strange things to win us into his forever family. Let's realize that God knew what he was doing when he called you. He knew what he was doing. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Praise his holy name indeed. That, as they say, is the bottom line. Let him glory in the Lord. This is a call to humility of all of us. Because whatever we are, wherever we are, it's what he's called us to. Praise his, praise his name. Now, in Christ Jesus, you know, there's whole books that have been written about this enigmatic phrase, being in Christ. What he's really referring to is the, the most intimate, closest possible connection with our Lord. It's, it's really what we call spiritual intercourse. Just as physical intercourse is a form of intimacy, spiritual intercourse is a form of spiritual intimacy. That's what he's dealing with here. So wisdom includes righteousness. Christ is our righteousness. There's no our in the Greek. Sanctification and holiness in, is included. And of course, redemption. And so, uh, the way I love to f get this clarified is to recognize there are three tenses of salvation. We use the word salvation all the time, so much so that it loses its crispness. We have been saved, past tense, from the penalty of sin. That's a done deal. It was done on a cross 2,000 years ago, period. We are being saved from the power of sin. We call that sanctification. That's a work in progress. That's what's going on during our lifetime here. And we will be, we shall be saved from the presence of sin. And we call that redemption or glorification. Past tense, from the penalty of sin. Present tense, from the power of sin. Future tense, from the very presence of sin. Praise God. I think that's clarifying and hopefully helpful. Now for our next session, I want you to read the entire epistle. Between now and the next, next week when we get together, find time, read the whole epistle. It's not that hard to do. But what I want you to do is study carefully two chapters, chapters two and three. We'll zero in on those, of course, during our course. But do it in the context of the entire thing. And one of the questions you should ask yourself as you go through these two chapters, two and three, what are the key lessons there for us personally? There may be some surprises that come out of that. So with that, let's close with a word of prayer.